Let me first start by saying the comments which I will deliver tonight are mine and mine alone, and I do not speak for the President-elect of the United States. But let me thank you and tell you what a great honor it is to be here tonight. This invitation came when Donald Trump was still probably down 20 points in the polls, and no one thought that he had a chance to be the next President of the United States, so I was greatly honored to accept it. And while I recognize I may not be in the friendliest environments for conservatives, I am grateful to follow in the shadows of people like Ronald Reagan, Sir Winston Churchill, the Dalai Lama, <laughs> Mother Teresa, and so many others have spoken here. Now you can disagree or agree with their messaging, but it's truly a privilege this evening to stand before you. And in the words of the late, great Sir Winston Churchill, I was what grown-up people in their offhand way called the troublesome boy. And I think that sums up my relationship with the media during this election cycle. Troublesome. And I think that sums up Donald Trump's relationship with the media this cycle. Troublesome. You see, President-elect Donald Trump is the single greatest phenomenon to hit the United States in a lifetime. Now, you may say that that sounds like hyperbole, but Donald Trump is the first person, almost in the history of the Republic, to be elected President of the United States without first running for office before and being successful, or serving in some senior capacity inside the federal government. And while many will say that that is bad, and that he doesn't understand the government, see, I believe that to be his greatest asset, so how did Donald Trump get there? Let's take a quick look back at what propelled him to the most historic victory in American history. And let's start with the media bias. You may not believe this, the media is biased. So as you may recall, when I joined the campaign in January of 2015, zero political pundits, the experts, gave Mr. Trump any chance of announcing that he would actually seek the GOP nomination, let alone secure it and go on to win the presidency. So let me read to you some of the things that those pundits said. CNN's Michael Smirconish called Donald Trump the George Costanza of the 2016 election, a reference to Seinfeld. The Washington Post, Jennifer Rubin called Donald Trump a pathological liar, narcissist, know nothing, who will never succeed. George Will, the famed columnist, actually quit the Republican Party over Donald Trump's campaign. And Mark Thiessen, found Donald Trump so unpalatable that he actually preferred torture over Donald Trump. The good news is that a recent study released by the Media Research Center found that 69% of the respondents do not believe the news media people are honest or trustworthy and truthful. 78% of the voters believe that the news coverage of the presidential campaign was biased, with nearly three in one believing the majority of the media were for Clinton, 59% to 21%. Even one-third of the 32% of the Clinton supporters believe that the media was biased. 8% of Trump voters said they would have voted for Hillary Clinton if they had believed what the media was saying about Trump. But this is the most staggering number. 97% of the voters say they did not let the media bias influence their vote. Think of how far the media, how far the media has fallen. 97% of the people who voted say they did not allow the media's bias to impact their vote. The media experts and the pundits said he just wanted publicity and he wasn't a serious candidate. So what we did is we began to lay the groundwork for a real campaign. We filed a personal financial disclosure statement early, which is a document which outlines his financial holdings. When the media said he would ask for multiple extensions, and when it actually came time to file that, he would withdraw because he didn't want to show how rich or not rich he truly was. And then I went out and I tried to hire the best political operative I could find, and I found a man by the name of Chuck Laudner in the state of Iowa who was successful four years earlier in running the campaign for Rick Santorum, the U.S. Senator from Pennsylvania, who actually won the Iowa caucus. That was an easy hire. And then, following the hire of Chuck, I called every political person an operative that I had run into in the last 20 years and asked them to come join the Trump campaign. 
and almost to a person they turned me down. They told me this would be the end of my political career, I would never work again, and I would be lucky if I could get a job bagging groceries. Maybe they were right. Maybe it was a bad political career, but I'm looking pretty good right now. <laughs> so I signed on to the Trump campaign, and slowly and methodically, we started to build a small, hardcore team in three early states, Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina. And these state-based individuals, along with five people in our headquarters, built a presidential campaign that went on to shock the world. Little did we know what we were about to get into. So you see, all of us came to the campaign for a different reason. Some were attracted to the campaign because we were political outsiders who were tired of a broken Washington, D.C. Some came to the campaign because they thought it would be pretty cool to have Trump's name on their resume if this were to last, you know, two or three months. And some came to the campaign because they couldn't find any other work. But for whatever reason it was, we joined together. And for a brief period of time, when no one thought it was possible, those people in those three states, and the five people working on a presidential campaign out of New York, had such a bond, something you can't replicate, something that other campaigns beg for. There was no infighting, there were no media leaks. There was nothing other than total support for one another with all one goal in mind, to get Donald Trump elected president. And you say, wow, that may sound naive, but it's amazing what people can do, and you've heard it many times, if no one cares who gets the credit for it. And while I had the privilege of being the campaign manager, I was just one of five people who helped make decisions and drive a train, what we call the Trump train. And the Trump train, it grew and grew. And what the media missed, but I saw, was something that you witnessed here. The American people were angry. They are angry. They've been lied to for a long time by Republicans and Democrats alike in Washington, D.C., making promises that were never kept. Seeing our country with $21 trillion in debt when they were told they'll get a tax cut and that will reform the health care system and all the other promises that were never adhered to. And Donald Trump has the ability to feel the same frustration as a blue-collar worker. And not only did he feel that same frustration, oh, you think it's... You laugh, you'll see. Not only did he feel that frustration with the waste and abuse of our government, with their broken promises and their spending and their multiple failures, but that's what drove him to run. And his ability to communicate effectively, but more importantly, authentically, propelled him to victory. And we dubbed him the blue collar billionaire. And when Donald Trump went around to those states that you can now look back and saw that he won, states like Ohio, and Iowa, and Michigan, and Wisconsin, and states that a Republican hasn't carried since Ronald Reagan ran for re-election in 1984. People say, how did that happen? It's because I saw every time Donald Trump showed up at an event, the people would stand in line for hours. We'd have a few protesters, much more than these, that's for sure. <laughs> and they were louder and more aggressive. But what I also saw was hardworking people who were working two jobs, we're tired of politicians getting rich. And in my old hometown of Lowell, Massachusetts, Donald Trump showed up there on a January snowy night. People waited in line for eight hours to fill an arena by the name of the Paul Songus Arena. Some of you may know the name. And in that blue collar town of Lowell, Massachusetts, people saw something that they've been waiting for for a long time. It was hope. It was someone who couldn't be bought by Washington special interests because he had enough money. And it was someone who'd tell them things that other politicians wouldn't tell them because they were afraid to or thought they couldn't get elected if they said it. And what we saw was in Mobile, Alabama, Donald Trump put 35,000 people in a football stadium on a Friday night. And then we went to Dallas, Texas the night before a debate and he put 20,000 people in a basketball stadium owned by Mark Cuban, who at the time was a friend of ours, became an enemy, now is a friend again. Politics works that way. But as we began to travel the country, 
we knew that we had to be better than the rest of the teams. And whether that was Jeb Bush's team or Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz or any of the others, our expectations were higher because nobody ever thought Trump was real. So we came up with a small philosophy that I stole from Coach Bill Belichick of the New England Patriots. And he said, do your job. Nobody else is just yours. And if you do that, you'll win. And there were five of us doing our own jobs, plus the teams out in our states. And what we knew was that based either on Donald Trump's ability as a showman and a successful entrepreneur, or because he's now a politician, we could pack an audience. And we used that to our advantage by generating earned media and making sure that we did our events in prime time and that the networks would cover us. And when you think about the strategy, we used the media in the sense of they carried our message far beyond just the reach of the people in those audiences, whether they were 5,000 or 10 or 20. But CNN would cover it live and NBC and Fox and ABC because they all want to know what Donald Trump is going to say next. And going to a Trump rally is a little bit like going to a soccer match. Why do you go? Because you don't know what's going to happen. You go because you want to see it. You go because you want to tell your family you saw it in person. You go because you don't know if it was a baseball game and someone pitches a no-hitter. It could be the last time in history it's ever been done. So people would stand in line for hours to go do these things. And when you have a personality like Donald Trump, who could bypass the mainstream media by either going directly to the people via broadcast, or more importantly, by maximizing social media and going to Twitter, it has completely revolutionized the way people campaign. You know, we go often called Donald Trump, and you'll love this, the Ernest Hemingway of 140 characters. Because at no time, if he put out a tweet, would it not appear on the news. Donald Trump would be in his pajamas and he'd be tweeting something. Next thing you know, Fox News would say, we have breaking news. Donald Trump has just tweeted that he's in his pajamas watching our show. <laughs> wow, that's power. And the social media platform continued to grow and we continue to invest in social media. And now we're at the point where Donald Trump has 25 million followers between his social media accounts, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. And that's amazingly important. But what you also have with Donald Trump is something akin to American Pharaoh, if anybody knows what that is. See, American Pharaoh was a great racehorse who won the Triple Crown in 2015. There's only been 12 horses in the history of horse racing that have ever accomplished that task. And my job with the Trump campaign was not to put a bridle on American Pharaoh, but to put blinders on her and ride her into the corners. But you gotta let her run. And that was my philosophy of the Trump campaign, and many of you maybe heard it, maybe you didn't, but I came up with the slogan that said, let Trump be Trump. And what that meant was, when you have somebody who is so forward-thinking that has had their finger on the pulse of the American people for as long as he has, and understands fundamentally what they want to hear, and more importantly, isn't afraid to share those comments, you have to let that person do that. So let me just share with you a couple quick stories of my time with Mr. Trump, probably stories that you don't know, that can first humanize him, and I'll talk about what his agenda looks like moving forward, and we can discuss the presidential campaign, but I'm really interested in getting to your questions. So, as I said, from the very beginning, I wanted to let Trump be Trump. And I think Donald Trump is probably the single hardest working individual I have ever met in my life. In 18 months with him, I flew on his plane for about 1,400 hours or 58 straight days. And during that entire tenure, I never saw him sleep. It was amazing. And for all of that time, I can count on one hand the number of times we actually sat down and had a meal. And I can tell you one time we did sit down and have a meal, we were at a steak restaurant, and the woman came over and said, would you like sparkling water or tap water? He said, which steak do you have almost done? Because he wanted to be doing the next thing, because making America great again is a very hard task. And it takes time. And sitting down and having a steak, you're not gonna get it done. So we didn't do that. We ate McDonald's on the plane and Burger King. If we were real lucky, we'd grab Chick-fil-A. Uh, but that was it. This campaign was lean and mean and wasn't a bureaucracy. We wanted to get the next thing done. And the first time I really knew that Donald Trump was a special candidate was when we landed in the state of New Hampshire, my home state, in a small airport up in the northern part in the town of Laconia. And we had taken off from LaGuardia and we were on the small plane, a Citation 10, because the 757 doesn't fit in the airport up there because it's too big. And when we landed, my phone had 15 voicemails on it, all from the same number. 
And I answered the phone, I, and, I, and I looked, and it was uh, one of the local police officers. And he said, we got a problem. See, that night we were going to a VFW hall. We hoped to put 300 people in on a Friday night in the middle of the summer in Laconia, New Hampshire, to have Donald Trump speak. And I said, okay, sir, what's the problem? He said, we can't get you here. And I thought, traffic. I said, no, we blocked the roads. There's too many people. It was the first time of the campaign in July of 2015. We had a police escort, and we drove down, and we showed up at this VFW hall, which is a fraction of the size of this beautiful facility. And there were literally people standing on the roof of the building to see Donald Trump. And for a room that held 300 people, there were 1,200 people at the place. They probably stuck 600 people inside. It had to be 110 degrees. And it was something I'd never seen in 20 years of doing politics in New Hampshire, my home state. And he stayed and made some remarks. And as we left the facility, he walked out and we got into the vehicles. And the people came over and started shaking the cars. And I said, man, I thought we were in trouble. They were happy. They were happy because someone was giving them hope. And as we drove away, they chased the cars. There's nothing like I'd ever seen. And I knew something very special was happening. And then on a different campaign stop, you know what Donald Trump did? He embraced his wealth, which is the exact opposite of what every candidate has ever done that was wealthy that decided to run for office. They would hide it. And this is not pejorative towards Mitt Romney, but Mitt Romney would never want to admit how much money he was worth, and Donald Trump is very proud of what he's built as a company. So what we did was something very different. We went out to the Iowa State Fair, first in the nation area, and as opposed to just showing up like every other candidate did, we flew out his Sikorsky helicopter and we landed at the fairgrounds. We made a giant spectacle. And then you know what we did? We brought the kids from the fairground up in the, up in the helicopter. And we took them around. And I remember this one little boy, Martha Raddatz, who's a national reporter for ABC News, was with us on that helicopter. And the little boy turned to Donald Trump and he said to him, Are you Batman? <laughs> Maybe it was the hair, I don't know. And he said, uh, Trump looked back at him and he said, Yes, I am. <laughs> and I said, how cool is that? And, and, you know, for that brief period, for that one moment in that boy's life, he thought he just saw a hero, a superhero, a live action figure. Because that's Donald Trump, because he's larger than life. Because he was doing something for that child that he may never have the opportunity to do again, which is to go up in this amazing helicopter and fly around the fairgrounds and come back down. And many people say that in order to be successful in life, you need to find what you love and success will find you. Our campaign was very similar to a movie called Happy Gilmore. Anybody ever see it? It's a 1996 movie of a golfer. <laughs> He's really happy out there playing. And the Bush campaign, the Rubio campaign, the Cruz campaign, they were Shooter McGavin. It was the other guy. And they couldn't believe this guy who didn't belong on the tour showed up and took over and kept on winning. Drove him crazy. But when you're happy and you're doing something, you do it to the best of your ability. And that's what our campaign was. Now, we didn't have to go and beat up Low Energy Jeb, or Little Marco, or Lion Ted. But it was a lot of fun, I got to tell you. <laughs> and if you're having fun, you're winning. Look, there's another example of, of Donald Trump who is willing to do and say things that the American people would never have expected. And let me tell you, we were in the state of South Carolina and we were driving to a small island called Kiowa Island before the South Carolina primary. And our press person, I was in the limousine with Mr. Trump, the armored plated car, and we were driving. And, and the press person said, um, hey, Mr. Trump, we just heard from the media pool that the Pope is putting out a statement from you, about you at noon. I said, the Pope? That's pretty good. And Pope turned to her and he said, is he endorsing me? <laughs> And I said, uh, I don't think so, sir. <laughs> and he said to me, what is the Catholic population of the state of South Carolina? I said, it's 11%. He said, are you sure? I said, 100%. I'm sure it's 11%. And he said, what time does the Pope's statement come out? I said, it comes out at noon. He said, I want to be standing at a podium at 11.55. I said, very good, sir. So without knowing what the Pope was going to say, this isn't, some, this isn't like John, this isn't little Marco. This is the Pope, okay? This is the Pope. This is... This is big league. <laughs> and right before the Pope got up to speak and give his remarks, because he had just left Mexico when he's flying back to the Vatican, Donald Trump came out and he blasted them, blasted the Pope. 
I'm a Catholic, right? My grandmother, you wouldn't believe it. So he said, the hypocrisy of the Pope to call on me to not build a wall between the southern border of the United States and Mexico is amazing considering he lives in a walled fortress of a city called the Vatican. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. Nobody in the history of the Republic, particularly of the Republican Party, who ever thought they were going to be running for office would dare take on the reverence of the Pope. That's not Donald Trump. And so what Mr. Trump would say and do, he would do anything that he felt was smart, but more importantly, truthful. And the results were many moments that would have been deemed political suicide. Whether it was about John McCain, where he said he liked people who weren't caught, or it was about the Khan family, who was a Gold Star family, that he attacked. See, most of those things only elevated Trump because it further emphasized him as the outsider. And his Twitter account became like a firing squad of sorts. And people would call and beg him, please don't tweet me. Please don't tweet against me, because they were scared to death of the repercussions. The power of Twitter for our campaign cannot be overstated. But with Mr. Trump, winning solves problems. See, Donald Trump is a big game player. And if you're down two points with 15 seconds left to go, you want to give this guy the ball because he's going to take the final shot and he's going to win. He's done his whole life. And after coming in second in the state of Iowa, a state where many people said we shouldn't compete in the caucus because he is on his third wife, and many people said that that wouldn't play well in Iowa because of their values. And we lost to Ted Cruz. We lost one delegate to Ted Cruz, and we flew back from Iowa, and we flew to my home state in New Hampshire. For the next 48 hours, that campaign was miserable. Now, mind you, there were 16 people in the race. We finished second, we secured 45,000 votes, more votes than any candidate in the history of the Iowa caucus, but we didn't, quote, win, we finished second. And with Donald Trump, winning solves problems and losing creates problems. And so we went to New Hampshire, and he was a very interesting man for the next 48 hours, publicly blaming Ted Cruz for stealing votes from Dr. Ben Carson. And, and what I said was, look, if we lose the state of Iowa, I'll if we lose the state of New Hampshire, I'll resign. And what happened over the next 48 hours after we lost in Iowa is we went to New Hampshire and our, our favorable, unfavorable plummeted. We were down eight points from the high. We were four points ahead of uh, Governor John Kasich of Ohio. And the campaign was imploding. And I called Mr. Trump's three grown children. And I said, let me tell you what's going to happen after we lose New Hampshire. We're going to go to South Carolina. We're going to lose South Carolina. We'll go to Nevada. We'll lose there. We'll run through the SEC, the, the southern states. And uh, Donald Trump will have spent somewhere between 20 and $100 million and will also be another rich guy who ran for office if we don't change the narrative. And if we don't outline what our vision is for America and if we don't say positive things. And after I had that conversation with Mr. Trump's three grown children, Mr. Trump came to a small office in Manchester, New Hampshire, and I asked him to sit down. It was just he and I, and he was eating a Big Mac because we were busy. So he grabbed that Big Mac and he was eating, and I said, Mr. Trump, I need to have a conversation with you. And that conversation was an inflection point in this campaign. And I said, you can continue to blame Ted Cruz for us coming in second place in Iowa. Or you can go tell people what you want to do to make their lives great again. It's up to you. But if you choose the former, we will lose New Hampshire in six days. And then we will lose the rest of this campaign. And it'll be a giant waste of money. And the following Tuesday, that night, Donald Trump left and he went and did a changing of the police department in Manchester. And started talking positively. And the following Tuesday, Donald Trump won 34% of the Republican primary vote in my home state, followed by John Kasich, who won 16% in a 16-way race. It was a complete blowout in our first victory on the way to 36 more. We rolled in South Carolina, and then Nevada, and then on to Alabama, and Arkansas, and Georgia, and Massachusetts, where Donald Trump took 49% of the vote in the Republican primary. But see, the pundits still didn't believe that Donald Trump was going to be the GOP nominee. If his name had been Bush, the pundits would have said he is running the greatest race in the history of the party. And we headed to the GOP convention with a fracture of Republican Party, and we came out more cohesive, but not fully unified. And on the Democratic side of the race, as you know, Hillary Clinton was running against a 74-year-old socialist from Vermont. And she had her hands full. Bernie had tapped into something on the left, which... Donald Trump had tapped into the right, which is the anger of Washington, and, Don and Bernie Sanders was killing Hillary Clinton amongst younger voters. 
And he moved her to the point that she had to change her position on the Trans-Pacific Partnership because she was losing so many states. And once that happens, see, people see that you don't believe in what you stood for a few minutes ago because it's not politically expedient anymore. It becomes real hard to convince people that you're authentic. And what we learned about the Trump campaign is whenever we got into a jam, everyone would call us and tell us to apologize. Donald Trump would double down, always double down. It was amazing, it was unheard of, it was unprecedented. If there was a fight that we were fighting, he'd say, no, let's double down, let's go after John McCain and say that he didn't do enough for the veterans over the 30 year career in the US Senate. It's the exact opposite of what every other person would have done. See, he took that tough talk and straightforward approach and put a message of America first out to the people. <laughs> and it resonated. And that may sound like isolationism to you, but to the American people who for a long time have felt that their politicians haven't put them first, it was, it was a welcome response. And like you and the Brexit vote here, the American people are really smart. They can decide for themselves what is best. <laughs> See, people telling the American, you know, elected officials and pundits and the elites telling you, if you vote for Brexit, the markets will crash and you will never survive. If you vote for Donald Trump, the markets will crash, the Dow will fall, people will be laid off, and it will be a disaster. Well, we know what happened. The Dow went up 250 points the day Donald Trump was elected. We know that three days after Brexit, the markets here were back at a peak performance. See, Donald Trump as a self-funding candidate didn't have to go and beg for money from donors. It was a great, great freedom. And it's something that I think the American people were really looking for and hoping for. As someone who could fund their own campaign that wasn't beholden to the Washington special interests so that he could make decisions which he thought best for the country should he be given the privilege. And what we built during those primary, early primary days only grew through the general election. In states where Democrats had not lost in 30 years, a revolution was quietly, and in some places not so quietly, taking place. See, we didn't rely on direct mail or fancy television ads. We didn't hire outside consultants who wanted to be paid these massive fees for returning phone calls. We relied on the heart and soul of the working class to propel the blue-collar billionaire to the White House. And as this campaign focused in the general election on the battleground states of Florida and North Carolina and Ohio and Iowa, they knew that they had to hold all of the states that Mitt Romney won and build if they were going to be successful. And so Donald Trump spent dozens of trips to Florida and multiple trips to North Carolina. And with 11 days to go in this election cycle, something amazing happened. The FBI director, James Comey, came out on a Friday and said that they may be reopening an investigation into crooked Hillary's emails. See how we just slide that in? It's amazing. It works every time. And what that did, what that did was remind people that there are two different rules in Washington, those for the elites and privilege and those for everybody else. And whether Director Comey ever moved forward with that investigation, it allows the campaign to have a little extra spring in their step, to redouble his efforts. And this is an individual, Mr. Trump, who worked 18 hours a day as if they were 15 minutes. And he doubled his efforts. And he ended up going from three and four campaign stops in battleground states a day to five or six or seven or eight. And when James Comey made that announcement, I happened to have the privilege of being with Mr. Trump that cold day in New Hampshire. And we need to know how to respond. And the decision from the people who were with Mr. Trump that day was, Empathy, hard to believe. And let's take a step back and see what the FBI director says because we think he's an honorable and good man, regardless of what the outcome is. And the Justice Department has a job to do and we should let them do it. You see, what Donald Trump never relied on in this campaign, he, he never relied on his surrogates to go out and talk on his behalf and we were knocked for it. We saw that Hillary had that all the time. But these last 11 days, Donald Trump was exceptionally disciplined you saw him on a teleprompter. You saw him doing less media. The team was using social media like no campaign in history, limiting our television ads. We were being mocked by the media all over the place, mocked for the number of offices we didn't have in the battleground states, mocked because of our lack of sophistication, mocked because the campaign wasn't big enough. You know, the networks, the newspapers, the online print journalists, they all made the same mistake. They counted out Donald Trump. It was a mistake they'd soon come to regret. 
And now, as you know, Donald Trump went on to win the campaign by the largest electoral margin since Ronald Reagan's re-election campaign in 1984. And in addition to winning all the states that Mitt Romney carried, Donald Trump won Florida, Ohio, Iowa, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. He was 4,000, he was 3,000, a little under 3,000 votes short of winning my home state of New Hampshire. Because in the, words of Ronald, in the words of Ronald Reagan, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. And with this dominant election victory, Donald Trump is going to have the ability to move his agenda forward. And I'll be happy to talk to you what that agenda looks like. But I think there's a, one important thing before I close, and, and I'll be happy to take the questions on his agenda, and we'll talk immigration and taxes and all those other things. You know, in addition to being thankful for the privilege here, I'd like to ask the people of my country to become united. And there are a lot of protests taking place right now because people don't like the election results. But what it really is, is there's one president. And we can agree to disagree on things. But we see people getting killed and hurt at these protests. And it's time to bring the country together. You know, Ronald Reagan, who happens to be my hero, also said, well, I take inspiration from the past. Like most Americans, I live for the future. And Winston Churchill also said, let us go forward together. <laughs> and I would just ask all of you, particularly those in the United States who continue to protest, that's your right and your privilege in our great country. But do it peacefully and respectfully and honor the 120 million people who vote in this election cycle because the democracy works. And if you don't like it, in four years from now you have the opportunity to change that. And if we don't abide by that system, chaos ensues. And with that, I'd have the privilege of taking some questions. <laughs>